Welcome everyone to Buddha's Center. My name is Jeff Allen and this evening once again we're discussing bodhicitta, the awakening mind, uh, the mind that aspires to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. Um, and we'll learn uh, as we go through this class more and more, uh, it's the only mind which can allow us to have complete bliss, uh, which can allow us to have this infinite happiness that we talk about, uh, this immeasurable happiness that we talk about uh, will be dependent upon this bodhicitta that we're learning about this evening. Um, and without the bodhicitta, without the mind that aspires to enlightenment, uh, we cannot achieve the state of infinite happiness. Uh, we may be able to get to the state of fearlessness uh, that's spoken of, uh, like the, the state of uh, individual liberation. Uh, we hear of the lesser vehicle or henayana states. Uh, of, of lesser realizations than a Buddha. Um, and what they're lacking is bodhicitta. And that's why they have lesser realization than the Buddha. Fearlessness is the same. They've gotten rid of cyclic existence altogether. If they're in nirvana, the samsara has ceased. And that's what we're afraid of. The suffering, suffering of change, suffering of suffering, and the pervasive compounded suffering ultimately is the thing that binds everyone in terms of suffering and cyclic existence. Everyone has this pervasive compounded suffering. So those that want to be free from it have a fear of the various types of suffering. You know, We engage in all sorts of behavior uh, because we're afraid we're gonna suffer if we don't. Um, so this practitioner uh, of the lesser vehicle, even though they no longer have any of those uh, types of suffering, they haven't fully, fully uh, um, developed themselves. And what hasn't been developed? Well, there's still the imprints of the afflictions left over for that being, even though they're in nirvana. Uh, and the only thing that can get rid of those is the practice of bodhicitta, uh, the practice of the mind that aspires to enlightenment, the practice of cherishing others in the same way that we cherish ourselves. that exchange of attitude that makes a Buddha cherish every single living being without biasness, that that emotion that allows the Buddha to cherish every every living being without bias and and has every li living being as his or her object of observation is what causes the infinite happiness. And we'll get into how that works in a moment. But first, let's just get started uh, before we get into too many technical details or before we get too lost in uh, different kinds of points of view. Uh, let's try to first uh, get into an intentional physical state uh, that will then allow us to get into a mental state that we can focus uh, and we can try to shut off all the stuff that's going on in the outside world, uh, the things that we're attached to and drawn to, the things that we're very angry about uh, and we we've, we've, we've feel aversion towards and we push away. Um, and Let's try to take all of those things. And as a good friend of ours says, let's put them in the parking lot. <laughs> and let's then try to put ourselves into a physical posture and a mental place that is focused and more realistic than all of these other things going on outside. A focused, more realistic place that we can then build uh, our motivation from. Uh, we, have, we need to start with a ground uh, that has some kind of neutrality uh, from which we can grow the virtue and the aspiration that we are uh, seeking uh, to grow. Um, so let's first start by getting into a physical posture uh, that will tell our that will tell us, hey, now we're getting into a posture. It tells our mind is telling our body to do something. So we're reinforcing the fact that we're about to get into uh, a, a spiritual practice. We're trying to get into a frame of mind from which we can become a Buddha. Uh, so we begin with some physical uh, intentional posture. So we get into the seven point Virakana posture uh, that we've spoken about quite frequently. We get our legs, uh, if we can, into the full lotus or half lotus or just cross-legged or even on the floor. Whatever we can do uh, within our uh, abilities, uh, that's suitable. We shouldn't try to do something that's impossible. If we have physical limitations that make that impossible, the Buddha would never say, well, then you're out of luck. <laughs> we really are trying to work on the mind. And once we reach the most advanced level, right, 
We can do meditation while we're sleeping. We can do meditation while we're flying. We can do meditation in all sorts of postures. Uh, but at our beginner level, it's very good to get into a posture that aligns our channels and aligns all of the things in, in our winds in such a way that's the most conducive to a beginner's level, enterer's level into the path to be able to develop some of these types of, of realizations that will be necessary for us to be able to, uh, in any position, realize the truth. Um, so let's get into an intentional position to realize the truth uh, and realize not only the truth, uh, realize that we can be a conveyor of that truth to every single being, and that's how we could ultimately help them. Uh, so we get into that posture with our legs in that position that we can get into. Um, as I said uh, before, whatever we're able to do, put our hands on top of uh, our right on top of our left in our lap. Uh, with our two thumbs touching, and this uh, I've heard recently in the triangular posture. Uh, so uh, you're pushing, you know, the the thumbs up a little tiny bit. So it's not just like this; they're they're up a little bit. Uh, so in the triangular posture, um, a recent detail I've heard that I, you know I think is wonderful. Uh, also, now we make our back straight like a stack of coins. Shoulders in a comfortable position with our arms kind of bowed out. Uh, if we can, in that comfortable position, our head slightly tilted down, eyes slightly open, focused at the tip of our nose, but our aim is to focus at the tip of our nose to shut off our, uh, our, our kind of apprehension uh, that we're doing with our eye consciousness. Um, so we're not trying to focus on something, we're focusing on a, a tip so that the our, our, conscious, our eye consciousness and what it's focusing on just disappears because meditation is done in the mind. Objects of observation of meditation are done mentally, um, but we don't wanna do them with our eyes closed because there's a lot of danger of laxity and falling asleep. And we don't want our eyes open completely because then that causes too much like, uh, distraction from our eye consciousness because we're apprehending all these things. What we're trying to do is shut off our actual sense consciousness when we're meditating and we're focusing on our mental consciousness, our mental consciousness, our mind is what's meditating. Uh, so that's why we're trying to get our senses shut down as much as we possibly can in order for our mental consciousness to be focused and for us to, where we do all of this work is on the mental consciousness. Yes, it's independent. The work is independence upon the winds and channels uh, that the mental consciousness rides on the winds, the subtle winds. But what we're really, really focusing on is transformation of the mind. Our objects of observation are in our mind. Our thinking of bodhicitta is in our mind. Our gom, our familiarization is done with our mind. Uh, so we're getting into this posture and we're keeping our eyes focused in that way so that they eventually, because there's no real folk, anything they're focusing on other than like, you know, the, say the tip of the nose, but that's just as a reference point, we're trying to just shut it down altogether so that it just becomes almost the static thing that's no longer focused on and our mind is all we're focusing on. Uh, so we're trying to shut down those physical senses uh, when we get into our mental exercises. Uh, so when we're focusing on the breath or we're focusing on an object or we're focusing on the Buddha or ourselves as a Buddha, whatever we're using as our object of meditation, we're using our mind to focus on those things. Uh, and we're not trying to see them as, as physicality uh, or we're not trying to use our, our eye consciousness, ears consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, tactile consciousness, we're shutting those off in this the case when we're trying to develop our minds. Um, so uh, we get into the seven point posture and we add the eighth, which is uh, the breath. Uh, so let's, uh, we and with the tongue, I don't know if I mentioned the eyes focused on the nose and then the tongue uh, behind the teeth uh, with the mouth in a comfortable position. Tongue behind the teeth won't allow our mouth to fill up with water. Uh, it'll allow it to kind of circulate nicely uh, and it'll also not allow us to, our mouths to become as dry and we're especially because we're breathing through our noses. Um, so just some more reasons why we're doing things the way that we're doing and just more tips that will help you to understand what you're doing because we wanna know what we're doing and why we're doing it. It should be producing transformation within us. 
Uh, and the only way it can really transform us is if we know why we're doing it and how we should do it, uh, et cetera. So I think it's in, in always uh, we should err on the side of wisdom uh, if we can. Um, so let's get into the seven point posture with our legs, our hands, our spine back, our shoulders, our head, our eyes, and our mouth, tongue. Uh, um, so legs, hands, back, shoulders, head, eyes, and mouth, and then the breathing. And let's breathe in and out in a very uh, normal fashion. Uh, just breathing all the way to the top and then breathing all the way to the bottom. And let's try to count our breath a little. Uh, and let's see uh, what number we can get it up to. And I recently heard a wonderful instruction that said, as we're counting the breath, say we're counting and we're focused only on the breath or focused on the breath and you know maybe a white dot or focused on the breath and you know ourselves or a deity in front of us uh, as we start to build on meditation. So if we're focused solely on the breath uh, and we're counting, just breath and counting, breath and counting, breath and counting, if we start to find our mind being distracted, instead of just letting ourselves feel like complete failures and saying, we have to start back at one, try to remember where you were and start from there. Because we're always trying to start from where we are now, right? So we got to the point where we could focus up to six. So then our minds wandered. Oh yeah, that's right. You know, a minute ago I was at six. So. So give yourself the credit for getting to six and start at six. Uh, and, and you can do it like that and see in a, if you're trying to do it for a specific period of time. You, you can do it the same way where we talk about in, in Pabunka's text, Pabunka Rinpoche's liberation in the palm of your hand by counting uh, and seeing how high we can get up before we're distracted. Um, we can do it the same way because if we're trying to do it for 10 minutes, we could see how high we get up in number in 10 minutes. Right. You know, if we're, we're 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 doing it in that fashion, if we're, you know, realizing, oh, a minute ago, I. I, uh, you know, got distracted and I was on number six. Right. So now of our 10 minute meditation, we've lost a minute. Right. So we're not going to get to as high a number as if we hadn't gotten distracted. So there's a couple ways that you can do breathing meditation and use it as a gauge to see how your monkey mind is behaving <laughs> how the crazy uh you know uh they call it sometimes the unrestrained elephant that's just running through <laughs> is behaving you know and if we can subdue it or if we've subdued it subdued it a little bit or not if we've reined it in a little bit or not um you know if, we, if we're we're making it uh, work for us or is it working us right our mind uh is our mind uh, we can check it that way. Um, so uh, let's get into that posture and let's do the breathing for a, a moment and we'll set our motivation. So let's begin thinking about the general types of suffering that we're all so familiar with. Let's think about the, four, the first noble truth. The Buddha stated that this is the superior truth of suffering. What did the Buddha mean? Think about the manifest suffering that we have to experience. Suffering of birth the suffering of getting old, suffering of getting sick, suffering of dying, being separated from loved ones, being separated from what we find is pleasant, having to meet with what isn't pleasant regularly, not getting what we want.
an understanding that because of our karma and afflictions, we will be thrown again and again and again into a body or into a set of aggregates beyond our control that has all of those components. So the Buddha said that this lack of independence, this force of karma and the afflictions that throws us into rebirth over and over and over again, pervades every living being in cyclic existence. Even though every living being in cyclic existence doesn't have a manifest suffering, every living being in cyclic existence doesn't even have the suffering of change which is actually happiness that baits us into thinking uh, that we aren't in suffering and then transforms into that suffering that we didn't think that we were in because of it. It baits us into the prison over and over and over again, even though some beings don't have that in the existence that they're living in. All beings, if they have the ignorance are thrown again and again and again into a set of aggregates that has among these three types of suffering and at least has to be thrown from whatever position they're in, even though they don't have manifest suffering, suffering of suffering, they don't have the suffering of change, but they have to be thrown and we will have to be thrown into another set of suffering aggregates. And usually when someone has so much happiness, it took so much karma to make that being happy, that the next step is the lower realms of cyclic existence, the hells, the eight hot hells, the eight cold hells, the hungry ghost realms, the animal realms that we see so well. And this being who experienced so much with, of, of bliss, but it was temporary. And now they have to suffer the greatest suffering that's just the opposite of that bliss because of this pervasive compounded suffering that every being in cyclic existence has to endure. So the Buddha said, this is that the truth of suffering is, and we have to endure that. And the Buddha said, the cause of suffering is what I just mentioned, that the karma and the afflictions driven by this grasping at its true self, caused us to be in the predicament that we're in over and over and over again. The Buddha said it could end, and the Buddha said, here's how. So let us be happy and think about the fact that there is a solution to all the forms of suffering, all of the fear that we have of all of the forms of suffering, that fear can be removed because what causes all the forms of suffering can be removed. So there's nothing to be afraid of once the causes of suffering are all removed. The Buddha said there's a pathway to it. And then the Buddha said, uh, if you rely on this path, it will all be removed. So you think how wonderful it is that there's a way we can get out of suffering. And then we start to think about other sentient beings that we care about and love. And we recognize that they are in the same exact system. They are in the same exact predicament that we are in. And unfortunately, they don't necessarily have a reliable guide to help them. We have a reliable guide. We found the Buddha's teachings. We can establish that the Buddha is a reliable guide. All sentient beings have not met with that reliable guide. And we aren't that reliable guide. So now we're in a predicament when we start to think about our loved ones. When we start to think about the fact that we have suffering, we have a solution, we have a way to get out of suffering. They have suffering. They may or may not have a solution to get out of suffering. How nice it would be if I could aid in that process somehow. When we start to try to build kind of a bigger mind that starts to think about all sentient beings by recognizing that we were born since beginningless time. We've been professional dyers. We've had every relationship with every being. So how nice it would be if all of those beings that we've had the 
most wonderful, intimate, kindest relationships with would have a solution, would be able to be free from their truth of suffering, be free from their samsara, their cyclic existence. And when we go to try to figure out how we can get ourselves there and how we can get them there, we realize that we are handicapped and aren't able to get them there, let alone get ourselves there. And we have to mature in order to get ourselves there. And if we want to be a reliable guide to show them how to get them get the get out of cyclic existence for themselves, we have to know how to do it. And we know we need to know what they need to do in order to get out of it. And without an omniscient mind, without knowing what each and every living being needs at that moment in order to move closer to the freedom from fear and infinite happiness, we're, we're incompetent. Until we have that ability, we're incompetent. Uh, so how do we get that ability? How can we help all living beings? How can we be free from our fear? How can we have infinite happiness? And we find that the way that we can reach all of those goals is be, be, by becoming Buddhas ourselves. So how do we become Buddhas? We become Buddhas through maturing our mental continuum to a place where it's undefiled, where it only has excellent qualities and has no negative qualities. How do we do that? We do that from gaining the wisdom from hearing, analysis, and meditation. So when we recite the prayers that we're about to do, recite them knowing that we're doing this in order to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings, in order to relieve all sentient beings from every type of suffering they could ever have to endure. This is why we're here tonight. We're here to become a Buddha, to become a reliable guide. And we shouldn't just recite these prayers, just like words into outer space. We should be thinking about the meaning, thinking about the in-depth meaning of the Heart Sutra and the emptiness that's presented of the Madhyamika Prasangika school uh, in the Heart Sutra and the five paths that are presented in the Heart Sutra implicitly and the understanding of the five paths and the emptiness of the five paths. Uh, so we really, really start to uh, mature more quickly when we are intentionally doing these prayers with the understanding. Uh, and we're not just saying them at, into outer space uh, because we think that that's what we have to do to get things started. Uh, so I know I spend an enormous amount of time on setting our motivation. And usually we just get right into prayers. But I think it's so important to set our motivation and to get to a clear place before we start reciting prayers uh, so that we can kind of start with our minds washed a little bit so that those prayers have even more of an ability to wash the dirty stains from our mind. Uh, not that they wouldn't by just reciting them. Of course, we're leaving imprints to wash those stains. Um, but think about how much more powerful medicine is uh, um, when you take it properly, when you, you know you're taking it exactly the way you're supposed to be taking it. It will be so much more effective. And the Buddha never, ever said, just aimlessly recite things. Go get a blessing. Let someone touch you on the head. Show up. If you go to the highest Lama possible and you sit in the room with them, then that's going to solve all of your problems. The Buddha would say that if that's what you think I taught, you were not listening. You have the responsibility of maturing yourself. And that's why we're here tonight. We can rely upon an instructor to give us the instructions, but if we don't implement those instructions, then we're just getting some imprints. And hopefully, then when we're more sensible, we can meet with the teacher. Maybe it'll be 150 lifetimes from now. We'll have to go to hell and be a hungry ghost and be a bug and then be an ant and, and do all these horrible things and not even know we had such an opportunity. And then we stumble into another opportunity and then we're, uh, you know, have a chance again. Do we want to wait till then? Or do we want to take, make use of this chance that we have at this very moment that happens just this once? It's so easy to lose and so difficult to find. 
Now is the time to take that opportunity. Now is the time to know what we're reciting. Now is the time to understand the depth of this philosophy that the Buddha presented. So we have an incontrovertible faith in it. So we actually practice it and believe it's true. We have to get to the point where we really believe this is true. Really believe this is true. And when we believe this is true, the more and more we believe it, the more and more it becomes the only thing that matters because we believe it's true. And that's the maturation that takes place. That's how it takes place. It's not a magical process. It's not through a blessing. Blessings are wonderful. We went to see Sakya Trichen. He gave us a wonderful blessing. He you know, put the stick on our head and you know, gave us, but also gave us transmissions of many mantras. But if I thought that I was gonna be able to get out of any work in the Dharma by going and getting touched on the head by one of the highest lamas alive, then I'm being a stupid Buddhist, as Geshe Dorji Damdu would say. Buddha would come next to me and say, you are stupid. This isn't what I taught. This isn't what I taught you. I taught you, you have to study, you have to learn this, you have to understand, you have to investigate this. I never told you you could just go somewhere and have this happen and get some sort of blessing and be all better. No. It's independence upon the blessing. And you understand what the blessing is. And you have some sort of guru devotion. And then you understand why this teacher is a qualified teacher. And then you go there and you've understood other teachings from them. And then you understand they're so qualified and such a great master and you bow to them and pay homage and they touch your head and you know they're worthy of giving you that blessing because they've matured your mind through teaching you something and through learning. And you know they're a great master. Without understanding all those qualities, you can come in and I'll have Suma touch you on the head. You know? Not that there isn't, you know, some sort of blessing you can get with faith. I understand the stories in the Lam Rim. The kid brings home a tooth from a dog, tells his mom it's a Buddha's tooth. She makes prostrations to it. It starts to glow. I understand. But let's try not to use completely mystical stories in a faraway land with faraway people to kind of, you know, think about how spiritual transformation can take place. There's a huge foundation that 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 you know boy's mother had in the Dharma, where she revered Buddha Shakyamuni and understood he was a reliable teacher. So thinking that she had some part of him and bowing to it, it became a stupa, it became a, a, an object of enlightenment in her mind. But that faith was not made blindly if that worked. I assure you. Because you could make anything anything if blind faith worked. So anyway, uh, let me get started with the Heart Sutra. And uh, let's set our intention uh, that we're reciting the Heart Sutra for the sake of all sentient beings in order to become a uh, Buddha. Um, and then we'll get started. The Sutra of the Heart of Transcendent Knowledge. Thus have I heard, once the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajgriya at Vulture Peak Mountain, together with a great gathering of the Sangha of monks and a great gathering of the Sangha of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed One entered the Samadhi that expresses the Dharma called profound illumination. At the same time, noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, while practicing the profound Prajnaparamita, saw in this way. He saw the five skandhas to be empty of nature. Then through the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra said to noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, how should a son or daughter of noble family train who wishes to practice profound Prajnaparamita? Addressed in this way, noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa said to Venerable Shariputra, O Shariputra, a son or daughter of noble family who wishes to practice profound Prajnaparamita should see in this way. Seeing the five skandhas to be empty of nature, form is emptiness, emptiness also is form, emptiness is no other than form, form is no other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness are emptiness. Thus Shariputra are all dharmas are emptiness. There are no characteristics. There is no birth and no cessation. There is no impurity and no purity. There is no decrease, and no increase. Therefore, Shariputra and emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no perception, no formation, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no appearance, no sound, no smell, no taste, no touch, no dharmas, no eye datu up to no mind datu, no datu of dharmas, no mind consciousness datu, no ignorance, no end of ignorance up to no old age and death, no end of old age and death, no suffering, no origin of suffering, no cessation of suffering, no path, no wisdom, no attainment, and no non-attainment. 
Therefore, Shariputra, since the Bodhisattvas have no attainment, they abide by means of Prajnaparamita. Since there is no obscuration of mind, there is no fear. They transcend falsity and attain complete nirvana. All the Buddhas of the three times by means of Prajnaparamita fully awaken to unsurpassable true complete enlightenment. Therefore, the great mantra of Prajnaparamita, the mantra of great insight, the unsurpassed mantra, the unequal mantra, the mantra that calms all suffering should be known as true since there is no deception. Prajaparamita mantra is said in this way. Teyata om gate gate paragate parasangati bodhisoha. Thus, Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound Prajnaparamita. Then the Blessed One arose from that samadhi and praised Noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, saying, Good, good, O son of noble family. Thus it is, O son of noble family. Thus it is. One should practice the profound Prajnaparamita just as you have taught, and all the Tathagatas will rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Venerable Shariputra and Noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, that whole assembly in the world with its gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, rejoiced and praised the words of the Blessed One. Gala jube ne jo damba ne nguje do jo ngai do do jen ru ba bo la ma yi bo jen si ni zong kan ro so la sha ze lo. Aga so ma re de shan de ra so ma re be aga so ma re de shan de ra so ma re be. Aga samara ta shanara samara yam be te ata on gati gati bara gati bara san gati gati so ha baba kancha san ji ka itimi jo ji se sabo do ji me sabo do ji se wa do ji ragi ba ja me do me ju tan ji se ding go ri so ha ge ri en zong ja ji se se wa da me do nu be jan da an de wa da tong ba jun ji pun zong zong jo ji da si de jan den da de le so the fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. Holy Lamas high, wrap the sky of your Dharma bodies in massive clouds of knowledge and love, and let them pour upon the earth of your disciples as we are ready, a shower of rain, the teachings deep and wide. Mm-hmm. Send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious Guru. Idam Guru Rana Mandala Gam Niradayami. Zanje Jadan Zaye Janam La Janjo Badu Danye Jazuji Dagi Jije Jibe Zanam Jidrola Benji Zanje Jubajo. Zanye Jadan, the Jia Janam, La Janju Badu, Danye Jazuji, Dagi, Jinye, Jibezonam, Jib, 
Notre Lame et Dieu, son Dieu, du bonjour, son Dieu, du don, du Dieu, du nom, la jambe, du bado, dernier, du souci, la guide, du bébé, son âge, du lame et Dieu, son Dieu, du bonjour. May this teaching be understood in the language of all sentient beings. Okay, so wonderful. Uh, we get to talk about uh, bodhicitta again. Um, before we get started with talking about bodhicitta, I'd like to share with you uh, something that I found to be so wonderful, uh, Geshe Dorje Damdu. Uh, at the beginning of the Nalanda course that I'm taking, uh, goes over the life story of the Buddha. And normally, when you hear the life story of the Buddha, it's very, very long. Uh, you, you go over the 12 deeds, uh, and you go over this huge biography of he was this child, and he was so intelligent, did so many amazing things, and he mastered the arts, and mastered all of these things, and you know, even like took steps when he was born and said, I'm the, you know, the best in the world. I'm the best being, you know, have all of these stories that you hear about the Buddha. And, you know, some of them seem like kind of contradictory at times uh, when you're looking at them. Contradictory in the sense that, you know, you, you have this Buddha who's supposed to be this genius, right? He's a prince, right? He's an incredible genius. And then they want you to believe that he's like 16, his buddy, throws him in a chariot and he doesn't know people get sick. <laughs> he doesn't know any, you know, there's any problems in this world. And that's actually a way that the Buddha acted maybe to teach the chariot driver. Oh, there's a sick person. What's that about? Oh, there's a dying person. What's that about? Oh, there's a holy person. What, why do they seem so happy? Right? Um, so we have to look at the fact that at the highest sense, Buddha Shakyamuni was already a Buddha. So there's one way to tell that story like that. So the Buddha Shakyamuni is already a Buddha. He emanates to this world and goes through all of these adventures for our sake to show us what it would take to become a Buddha, okay? Or there's the story that he's just a Bodhisattva prince and he's going through all of these things uh, in his life real time. Doesn't matter which way you want to look at it um, with this particular presentation, because it, it's fine either way. But I found it to be so, so incredible. And I found it to be so important for refuge. And when we say, I want to become a Buddha for the sake of sentient beings, who is that Buddha? Right? We talked about the bodies of the Buddha. We talked about what a body, what a Buddha can do once they're a Buddha. But who is this Buddha we're talking about? And and why, why are they any better than anybody else on the street saying something, right? Why, you know, a lot of people can say a lot of things, you know? What makes this being special? So the way that Geshe Dorje Damdula uh, explains the Buddha's life story is by taking two lines from Dig Naga's uh, Pramana Samuchaya. Uh, um, uh, so the Pramana uh, Samuchaya is the compendium to valid cognition by Lord Dignaga. Dignaga was maybe around the sixth century. Uh, and then a hundred years later comes Dharmakirti, who we talk about a lot. He wrote the commentary on the compendium of valid cognition. So Dharmakirti, we hear this text, the Pramanavartika Karika, Dharmakirti's text on logic and reasoning is a commentary on Dignaga's text called the compendium of valid cog cognition. Uh, so the Pramana uh, Samuchaya. Uh, so Acharya Dharmakirti wrote just these two lines about Lord Buddha. And then a hundred years later, Dharmakirti, you know, reads this and just is so blown away at the depth of these two lines, how much it encompassed and what it really, these two lines meant, mean. And then Dharmakirti wrote a commentary on Dignaga's text and spent an entire section of the text on establishing the Buddha as, you know, a reliable guide, etc., establishing that the Buddha exists, you know, the existence of Buddha, establishing it. And Dharmakirti played off of part of this text, Dharmakirti's text plays off of this two lines 
that Dick Naga was able to write with so much meaning in them. And I think that it's so wonderful that we can we can read them. So we just took refuge, right? We said, I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Uh, through the merit I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. So we're taking refuge in Buddha. And then we're saying, we want to be, become you, right? Mm -hmm. So why are we saying that? So when we say we want to become a Buddha for the sake of beings, that's bodhicitta. That's what we're learning how to get. But why would we want to get it, right? When we learned about some of the um, causes and conditions uh, for, for getting bodhicitta, you know, there's a faith that's focused on the conqueror, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, that was part of it. That was one of the things that was necessary that we were going to need to have uh, in order to get bodhicitta. Um, I believe it's under uh, the, let's look it up, let's to be exact. Um, uh, it's under, yeah, under the mental base uh, that's necessary in order to get bodhicitta. Um, so uh, we see this faith that observes the conqueror is necessary uh, in order to get bodhicitta. Um, so if we know that that's necessary, uh, then uh, who's the conqueror? Why should we have faith in that person? Uh, what does that even matter? You know, why do they matter? So Dignaga has these two lines and then I'll unpack them and you'll see just the relevance of these two lines. So it, it reads as follows, uh, Master Dignaga, an Indian pundit. Um, and, and we'll, you know, as we go through these classes, it's good for us to, you know, kind of mention these pundits names, mention what they wrote, um, and maybe mention a little bit about them. Um, Dignaga was an incredible, incredible logician of his time. Uh, and he uh, was, there's a special story about him that he was writing on tablets. Uh, he was writing uh, all this tough stuff about logic down on tablets. And uh, he would have to, you know, take a break and go to town and do stuff. Um, and every time he got back to his hut, his, where he was staying, he'd find that someone had erased the tablet that he was writing on. So he kept finding this happening over and over and over again. And so there's a tradition during this time in India that you debate, you know, you don't, you know, just say somebody's wrong or, or try to do tricks on them. You debate them. And the rule in India at the time is that if you debate them, and you defeat them, and you defeat their system, then they become your student. So this is the kind of uh, system of etiquette at the time. So, so Dig Naga is coming back each time. He's finding somebody's erasing his thing, his text he's writing on logic. So he finally writes, I don't know, you know, who's, this is a really, I don't know if you know this, this is a religious text. So if you're just playing tricks, you're just like having fun, Please stop doing this. This is really important what I'm writing. It's a religious text. If you're erasing it because you disagree, come debate me. <laughs> you know, either stop doing it because this is important, it's religion. And if it's a practical joke, it's not funny. And if you're doing it because you know more than I do and you think what I'm saying is blasphemy or untrue or logic's not important, then come debate me. So he writes this down. Next day, and someone comes to challenge him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they start the debate, uh, and, you know, Dignaga is able to do very well. But this mischievous student, person, not student of Dignaga, opponent, uh, has developed some kind of special powers, which we as Buddhists, you know, uh, if someone can fly, okay, but have, are they are they liberated <laughs> from cyclic existence? Because we believe that you could become able to fly. We believe that you could read someone's mind, but are you liberated, right? So this person had developed this crazy mystical, magical power to be able to like make fire, you know, come out of his mouth or something like this. And the story goes. So he burns all of Dignaga's clothes off. <laughs> and Dignaga is because he can't defeat him with logic. So he burns all of his clothes off. And Dignaga says, you know, I'm supposed to have, he goes home, right? The thing's over, the guy leaves. Dignaga's naked. You know, he probably doesn't have a lot of clothes at this point, right? 
and, and he says to himself, you know, I'm supposed to work for the sake of all living beings. And I can't even have the patience with this, just this one, <laughs> you know? So what am I even doing here? Why am I even writing this? You know, I don't see, you know, I, I, I don't see any reason to even do this. So he takes the slate and throws it up in the air to, to let it smash, but it doesn't land on the ground. <laughs> the, the, the tablet never falls on the ground. And Dignaga is very curious and looks up and he sees the Buddha of wisdom holding it. And he's saying that this, will, this is going to be necessary. How dare you give up your altruistic intention? This will be the key. Uh, this, this will be the key to unlock the understanding of wisdom. Logic is the key to unlock the wisdom's understanding. Um, so then Dignaga wrote the uh, Pramana Samajaya. Uh, and it became known as the key to enter the door of philosophy, logic, understanding of cause and effect, valid cognition, things that are invalid. You know, what's the difference between valid cognition, invalid cognition, right? Uh, what's mistaken view? What's a correct view? So all of these things were addressed in these logic texts so that we would have tools to be able to use when we're studying, tools of analysis tools of understanding to be able to use uh, when we're studying. So this wonderful, wonderful two lines says the following uh, from the Pramana uh, Samuchaya uh, by Adignaga. The one who is transformed into a reliable guide, motivated by altruism to benefit sentient beings, the teacher, Sugata, protector, to you, I make prostrations. So it sounds like, okay, you know, normal, just homage to Buddha Shakyamuni, right? Okay, what, 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 what's in there that's just so amazing that made Dharmakirti's mind explode like fireworks going on? What's so amazing in that? So let's look at it. The one who is transformed into a reliable guide. Okay. Reliable guide for whom? Okay, so we're... Let's speak of it in terms of all sentient beings. Let's speak of it in terms of ourselves. Let's start with ourselves. If we wanted to go somewhere that was foreign to us, and we had no idea how to get around, some of it's dangerous there. There's a lot of twists and turns, a lot of wrong roads you can go down. Some of them you go down, you'll be murdered. I remember hearing that I wanted to go to Machu Picchu somewhere I was interested in going. And I heard, I don't know if it's true or not, I, I apologize Machu Picchu if it's not, I've heard that you really have to get a guide if you wanna to go to Machu Picchu. You really have to have someone who knows their way around it because you can be robbed very easily. Machu Picchu is very be beautiful, but if you don't know your way around the town around it, or if you don't know the area, you're gonna run into some trouble. I remember the first time I went to India, you know, my reliable guide was some travel agents and said, oh, you know, when you get there, go here and go there. Um, but I didn't really know what was going on. And I was getting ripped off right and left. I didn't even know it. And then one of the, you know, uh, the monks, the Drepung monks, I think, or dialectic school monks started to show me around the ins and outs, the ways of bartering and started to make me understand like, okay, no, you, you're lucky. You shouldn't have gone over there. Oh my gosh, you know, that's not even a safe place for you to go at all. Why would you go there? He started to let me know about all of the mistakes in my journey I was making. And I started to realize if I had had a guide, a reliable one <laughs> to take me around, a lot of the you know, learning curve wouldn't have been there. And a lot of the pitfalls that I fell into wouldn't have been there. Um, so if we want to go anywhere that is uncertain, has a lot of twists and turns, and has an opportunity for something bad to happen, right? Um, we we would we would say if we have a place we're going where we have those opportunities, we would seek out somebody who knew their way around. Okay. So what are we trying to achieve as Buddhists? We're trying to achieve the absolute annihilation of all of our suffering, so therefore the annihilation of all of our fear, 
and we're trying to achieve infinite happiness. So how are we going to do that? Who are we going to find who knows how to achieve infinite happiness and freedom from fears? We would have to find somebody who's been there, who is dwelling in the city of infinite happiness and freedom from fear, because they know how they got there. They know exactly the roads to take, the roads not to take. They know the pitfalls. They know where the robbers are, the people who will cheat you by telling you this is the truth. I promise you, this is the truth. Just give me some money. Uh, you know, I'm a yogi. I'll teach you all this fancy stuff. I really don't have suffering myself. And then you look behind the curtain, there's all this suffering and all this magic going on. You know, I, I once had a good friend who 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 went and saw this, this guru who was so, so famous, doesn't imagine, matter their name. Now you go on, and he was so sure. He was actually a very logical person too. You know, he was someone who had been around the block. Let's leave it at that. He went to India, met a guru, said he was doing all this magic and he knew it was true. Now you might see all the YouTube videos, same guru. They're slipping him things. He's, you know, he's doing all this magic, but it's just magic. Like David Blaine. We're not going to go rely on David Blaine because he can create an illusion in front of us. We're going to lie on somebody who's reliable. Now, how do we find out who's reliable? Well, the Buddha said, here's what I, this is the truth I've learned. This is the cause of what I've learned the, to be the truth. This is what causes, these are the causes, this is the truth I've learned, etc." But then the Buddha said, but don't listen to me because I'm Buddha. Cut it and rub it and check it. So the way that we establish that the Buddha is a reliable guide is we believe based on what he says is true, that he realized something that others didn't. So is it making sense? So we're, we're realizing that the Buddha is reliable by checking it. And the Buddha said to check it. The Buddha didn't say, oh, just believe this, the ultimate expanse, and just close your eyes and, and just imagine space and just imagine you're in space, shut off all cognitive thought. The Buddha wasn't interested in temporary solutions. Those things that I'm speaking of can make you feel good temporarily. Going to the spa is a temporary solution. But you want infinite happiness. The spa is happy. You go to the spa, put on the music, and get a back rub, everything's good. But an hour or two later, when someone cuts you off while you're driving, it was not the solution because anger arose involuntarily. The spa didn't stop that involuntary arisal of anger, which makes you feel terrible. So if you're looking for something that doesn't end in terms of happiness, you have to find something that would cause that infinite happiness. And if you want to cause the end of suffering, you have to find out what causes it, get rid of those things, and then you can be free from suffering. So there has to be a system that produces those two things that the Buddha says that he has. And the Buddha says, check me, check and see if it's true. So how did the Buddha go about checking to see if he knew it was true? Now we move back to the text. So what's a reliable guide? Someone who can bring you somewhere safely and get you to that destination. That's a reliable guide. Not somebody who, who brings you, says they're a reliable guide. I had some other reliable guides in India, but we seem to keep going to their cousin shop over and over again to buy things. I said, I don't want to buy anything. We kept stopping for breaks and we were at their cousin's shop. Their motivation was to get a, some kind of kickback on something I was going to buy at a shop. They weren't a reliable guy. I didn't want to go to any shops. They brought me there because their motivation, they were being selfish for themselves. So what, what else? What else do we need out of a reliable guide? Well, then we start the life story of the Buddha. Motivated by altruism to benefit all sentient beings. Why did the Buddha leave the palace? Why did Prince Siddhartha get all worked up and leave the palace? Some say he saw a dead person. Some say he saw this. Some say he saw that. 
But if you really look at what was going on at the time with this bodhisattva, you'll see that he was anti-discrimination. He hated the caste system. He didn't think it was fair. He knew that all beings had the same potential, man or woman. He knew there was no difference whatsoever. He knew that there were all these wars going on in the Shakya clan. And there was all this injustice going on. He knew all of this. So there was a horrible things going on in the world at that time, horrible injustice. And this bodhisattva motivated by altruism to benefit others left the palace because he knew, okay, as a king or a prince, for worldly things, I could maybe do the most of anybody, right? You know, maybe I could make it so that there were laws that would make it more fair or something, but that would not make everyone have infinite happiness and be free from fears. He knew that as a prince, as a king, when he became king, that there was nothing he could do as a king to completely remove everyone's suffering and to give them infinite happiness. And he knew that it was possible. He knew because of previous lives of teaching, of studies, studying Buddhism, studying truth, he knew it was possible. He had to know it was possible. He had to have the inference to know it was possible. So motivated out of great compassion because he knew the only way he could help sentient beings was to find an answer to the question, how do I be fearless and how do I have infinite happiness? Until he could answer that question himself, he couldn't, he couldn't save anybody. He couldn't help anyone to the highest degree. He could give them strawberries. He could give them things that would temporarily make them happy. But he knew that there wasn't anything universally that he could give to everyone to free them from suffering and make them uh, infinitely happy. So motivated out of compassion, he leaves the palace. Okay. So it says the one who has transformed into a reliable guide. Well, how'd that happen? This is how the Dignaga, you know, quote goes. So how did that he transformed into a reliable guide? Well, motivated by great compassion to benefit sentient beings. He leaves the palace and he seeks out, it says, the teacher, Sugata, protector, to you I make prostrations. Why is he the teacher with a capital T? What's the Buddha do when he leaves? He doesn't just leave the palace. He leaves and he's in search of a teacher. A teacher who can teach him how to be free from fear and have infinite happiness. And he's already a genius. You look at the stories, like, I don't know how many years old he is. He's mastered the arts of poetry and mastered sports. And when you look at the, you know, 12 deeds of the Buddha and you look at the life story of the Buddha, he's a genius by the time he's left the palace. And he's a bodhisattva with great compassion for beings once he's left this palace. So first he seeks out this teacher who's everyone says is one of the highest teachers in the world, who has the answers, who has achieved nirvana, who's liberated, who no longer suffers. Uh, so he goes to Acharya Alara Kalama. It's his first teacher when he leaves the palace. Um, so he goes to this Acharya um, Alara Kalama. And this is somebody who has a very, very extremely high level of meditative um, absorption. I mean, really high meditation level, you know, concentration level. Uh, he has really profound meditative powers incredible powers, you know, highest, some of the highest, some of the highest in the world. So Buddha Shakyamuni studies with him uh, and goes and, and reaches this very, very high level uh, that his teacher arrived at pretty quickly. He arrives at the same level as the teacher. Uh, and he says, okay, you know, uh, what, what more do you have to teach me? Um, and the first teacher says that, you know, I, I've told you everything uh, that you need to do. Um, and you can, you know, now uh, uh, just teach with me. All your students are, all my students are your students. We now have realized what we need to realize. There's nothing more to realize, this teacher says. And this teacher isn't even on the highest concentration level. But as you get to concentration levels, they are deceptive. And they seem like nirvana. 
and many a yogi and many a practitioner has reached these concentration levels and mistaken them for nirvana. Mistaken them. There are whole texts written about, I have achieved this nirvana that is this and the Atman. When you're speaking Atman, you're speaking of true self. You have not achieved nirvana. There is no true self to achieve nirvana. So when you, so the Buddha then says, no, I, I know I don't have freedom from all fears and I don't have infinite happiness. I know this hasn't happened. I don't have a solution to all the world's problems, all the world's fears, and I don't have a way to make everyone happy. What you've given me, if you say this is nirvana, then there's something wrong here because there's not, I've analyzed everything that you've taught me and I see, I see flaws. I see flaws in the logic and I know I'm not, I know I don't have freedom yet. So then he says, I'm sorry, I must move on. So Buddha leaves uh, Acharya Alara Kalama and goes to seek this other teacher. This other teacher is considered the most realized being in the world. Everyone agrees this being is, is enlightened. Everyone says that there's no higher guru. This is the guru who will teach you the final, final path. And this guru is actually doing well for themselves. They're at the peak of existence, the peak of cyclic existence, not, not to be confused with the last mundane state that we talk about on the path of preparation, right before you see emptiness, not to be confused with that. This is a level of the formless realm, not to get technical, but it's the peak, the highest level of when we look at the desire realm, form and formless realm, highest level of the formless realm, this teacher's at. He has a meditative concentration. He's in the highest level of cyclic existence that there can be. He thinks he's in nirvana. He thinks there's nothing more to learn. So the Buddha studies with him. Buddha very quickly achieves this peak concentration level. Uh, and the Buddha says, uh, you know, realizes it, has this peak level and goes to the teacher and says, what's next? Okay, you got to teach me what's next. He says, there's nothing next. You've realized the final truth. That's it. There's nothing more to learn. And Buddha said, oh, no, 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 no. I have these theories. I have other ideas in my mind. I, 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 through logic, I'm still in cyclic existence. You're still in cyclic existence. You will still re be reborn. You haven't gotten rid of fear. How do you get rid of fear? You end that forced rebirth. You end the pervasive compounded suffering. You, unfortunately, sir, even though you're at the peak of cyclic existence, still have pervasive compounded suffering. Even though you don't have the suffering of suffering, the suffering of change, and you think you're free, you aren't because you haven't understood this sudden, subtle impermanence, this momentary nature that's going on inside of you. It's a clock that's ticking, a karma clock that's ticking that will, the, the alarm will go off and the karma will no longer be powerful enough to keep you in that blissful state. And then you'll probably go to hell or hungry ghost or animal where you won't have all of this bliss of meditative absorption. And you don't know this, but I do. I see a flaw in you. I see a flaw in this logic. So then the Buddha says, you haven't realized it. Then this teacher again is called, I'm sorry, Acharya Udraka. He goes to the second teacher's name, Acharya Udraka. He goes to him and says, okay, what else do you have to teach me? Udraka says, you've realized everything. You've realized your liberation. You're liberated, my, my friend. Be, you know, be the teacher of my students also. And uh, Buddha Shakyamuni doesn't take it. Then Buddha goes uh, into meditative, isolation for six years. We hear about the six years of aesthetic practices uh, and he's with these other people he's with doing these aesthetic practices. Um, and what he's doing at that time, a lot of times we hear, oh, he's starving himself. He's doing this, he's doing that. And then he eats some rice and he realizes it's the middle way. Not quite that simple. <laughs> he's doing trials, human trials for six years on himself of what He's already reached the highest level of any teacher in the world, and he knows it's flawed. Now he's doing the trials on himself to make sure he's right. He's checking dependent origination, checking emptiness, combining it with this. He's at the peak of concentration levels. Now he's able to combine it and understand 
the emptiness more and more and refine it more and more and more through concentration. And if you understand concentration levels, you'll understand that you don't need to eat if you've achieved certain concentration levels. So this whole Buddha didn't eat for all these years and he's already achieved the highest peak of concentration. So he probably didn't need to. Don't feel so bad for him, feel bad for yourself. Don't feel bad for Buddha. The Buddha was doing human trials on himself to see if it worked. Geshe Dorje Dandu gave the, you know, the idea, okay, they come up with a COVID vaccine, then they have to do trials on humans to see if it works. Maybe not the greatest example <laughs> to give, but any type of, of, of medicine that comes out, right? It's been checked to see if it works first on someone, and then they give it to people if it worked. It isn't a perfect process, but you get the point. The Buddha had to test all this stuff on himself, whether it was in that life or in a previous life, he had to do it. If he's just replaying events, he had to do it. So the Buddha spent all those years to refine his understanding, refine his wisdom, make his compassion bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where he realized true selflessness and, and got rid of all selfishness. So the Buddha, when he got rid of all selfishness, and got rid of all grasping at ego and self. So got rid of the self-cherishing attitude and the grasping at I as being truly established. He became, now we move back to Dignaga's text, the Sugata, the one gone to bliss. Why did he go to bliss? Because he has gotten rid of all fears and has infinite happiness caused by bodhicitta. So he's gone to bliss. He is the one that's gone to bliss permanently, permanently in bliss, the Buddha. So he's Sugata. And then it says, protector, to you I make prostrations. Protector, protecting us from what? What is he capable of protecting us from? The fears of cyclic existence. Protecting us from not being infinitely happy. Why? Because he's a reliable guide to bring us there. How does the Buddha protect us? By teaching us the truth so that then we can become protectors, so that then we can become teacher, sugata, protector, reliable guide. I'll read it again. The one who is transformed into a reliable guide, motivated by altruism to benefit sentient beings, the teacher, sugata, protector to you, I make prostrations. So amazing. So the Buddha tells us how to get out of the six realms of cyclic existence. And then the Buddha, because he or she is out of the realms of all realms of cyclic existence, has no fear, so can tell us how to be fearless. And because the Buddha has infinite compassion and love for all sentient beings that he or she has as their object of observation, they are infinitely happy. So Geshe Dorje Damdu gave a, a, an example of why are they infinitely happy? What does that even mean, right? What is this bliss that, that everyone's talking about? You know, How does one achieve such a thing? Um, so he asked everybody about what was you know, one of the happiest moments in their life. And to cut to the chase, he ends up at one student uh, said to him, uh, somewhere that he was, uh, and as they started to talk, uh, started to have tears well up. And they said, really, the most happy I ever was um, was when my son was born. And this was a, a man saying this. And he said, when I first touched the hand of my child, this happiness I've never experienced before blossomed. So he said, okay, imagine you could multiply, apply that infinitely, countlessly. What if you could feel that way for every being? Imagine how much that happiness would multiply. That makes a lot of sense. Think about that. Think about when, even when I get a puppy, right? 
I don't have a child, so it's hard, hard for me, but I can get, I get it, you know, I get a puppy and I love this. I'm so happy. I have this love for this thing. I want it to be happy and I want to pet it. I want it to be happy, right? I want it to be just so happy. What if I could feel like that about a number of beings that I can't even count in my little mind? What if that, that happiness could be that big, right? Because when I'm talking about, you know, wanting immeasurable beings to have happy happiness and wanting me to wanting to bring them to that state, that's love. Wanting them to be free from suffering and the causes of suffering and wanting to take them to that state, that's compassion. That love is what's creating that happiness. That compassion is what's creating that happiness for the father at that moment touching that child's hand. So imagine if that that father could touch every being's hand and feel that way, how much that love would multiply, how much that happiness would multiply. Think about our unhappiness. A lot of times it's, you know, we're, we're having hard times with certain beings or their views or, you know, how you know, we have this friends, enemies, and neutrals. Imagine if you took all of that away and you only had, every time you saw any being, that love that, that, that man spoke of, of touching his child's hand. And you multiplied that, your internal feeling of happiness, you multiplied that times a number you can't count. That's what the Buddha has. That's this infinite happiness that the Buddha has. This infinite desire to be of equal benefit to all sentient beings. This impartiality, this love that sees each and every being as precious as that man did the child. And then how do you get that love? How do you get that kind of compassion? That's infinite. You do what we've been talking about for the last seven or whatever sessions. You start with equanimity meditation. First you start with, of course, we're talking about bodhicitta, but you have to start with figuring out how to become happy for yourself. Because as Geshe Dorje Damdu says, you want to export happiness, you got to have happiness to give. If you, if you, you know, want to export gold, you better have gold. Likewise, if you want to export happiness, if you want to say, I want to bring all sentient beings to a state of happiness, you have to have that to export. So you have to first understand how you would be free from suffering understand that you are suffering, that you definitely want to emerge. And that based on that desire to definitely emerge, to definitely have to get out of cyclic existence, you understand that, oh my gosh, everyone else has the same thing. And that desire to definitely emerge, that renunciation that wants you to get out from suffering turns into compassion and wants them to get out from suffering. But you can't turn, you can't turn that lens towards them until you have it, right? Until you have it to give them, until you have this happiness to give them, until you have fearlessness to give them, and to, until you have eternal happiness to give them. That's why you can't really help sentient beings in a total way until you're a Buddha. Because you don't have infinite happiness to export and infinite fearlessness to export. You got a lot of fear, a lot of sadness mixed with some happiness. And we try to stumble through and help sentient beings. But the only thing that can help is truth. And the only way that we can get to the truth that they need to know what truth they need is to be a Buddha and be omniscient so that we can present the Akum razor, that direct truth to them that they need at that moment. I'm guessing, right? I'm guessing based on what generally I learn, everyone needs, so I'm guessing. But a Buddha would be able to simultaneously speak to like these different boxes <laughs> somehow and say exactly what each of these boxes would need to hear in order to just propel them into Buddhahood. So that's why I know I need to become a Buddha and, I, and, and, and I need to become a reliable guide. So once again, the one who is transformed into a reliable guide, motivated by altruism to benefit beings, the teacher, the Sugata, protector to you, I make prostrations. May I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings, in order to become a reliable guide. In the meantime, I prostrate to you and I put 
put my spiritual well-being in your hands, Buddha, because I believe what you're saying and you, are, you have the best hands to put my spiritual well-being in because you, I can rely on. Others don't have a capital T. They can teach us how to get rid of suffering. They can teach us how to have certain types of, of bliss, but can they do it permanently? Can they teach us how to permanently get out of suffering? Can they teach us how to permanently have bliss? And that's the question that we have to ask ourselves when we, we look at what kind of being we want to become. And when we do all our homework, we'll find out it's the Buddha is that reliable being. And so how do we, how do we become a Buddha? Well, we do it through these steps um, of, of that, that start with equanimity, you know, understanding suffering for ourselves, uh, and then understanding wanting to get others out of suffering and this process that makes us want to become a Buddha. And then this maturation where we eventually become a Buddha um, that takes place. But all of these steps are necessary. So we, as I was saying before, we get to the point where we want to definitely emerge and then we want others to. Who are those others? This is when it gets tricky. Just saying we want everyone to emerge from suffering and have infinite happiness is very, very easy to say. But how do we practice it? How do we get there? Friends, enemies, neutrals, developing equanimity, impartiality towards those types of beings, wanting, being able to equally benefit those types of beings without any bias, not helping one more, not helping one not so much because they're strangers, definitely not helping them because they're enemies. We can't get past that part. If we can't deal with the folks that we have in our realm, in our real life, and start to expand upon them, then we will never, ever, ever get to a specific goal. We'll never get there. We have to be very specific in our meditation and use real objects of observation and make it bigger and bigger and bigger till we get that impartiality towards friends, enemies, and neutral, so we would equally be willing to benefit them. And then we start to try to build affection for them. And we go through the same process. We try to say, okay, all sentient beings have been our mothers, our kin, our loved ones, the closest, kindest people to us because of understanding beginningless cyclic existence by beginningless rebirth. Who are those sentient beings that have been our mothers? This is where the rubber meets the road again. There are friends, enemies, and neutrals. Very easy. All our, our mothers are our mothers. Very easy. Right? Strangers are our mothers, not as hard, but our enemies takes a little bit of analysis. But if we do that analysis, the Lamrim texts say that we'll arrive at a point where we see an ant and say, oh, I'm your son. I'm your child. I'm that vulnerable child. I was that vulnerable child that no one in the world knew, but maybe one or two parents that were there. No one, you know, some grandparents and stuff, but no one knew who you were. You're born, right? And there's these, you're very, very vulnerable. And there are these beings, some sort of beings, you know, even if you're, who knows, you know, but there's some sort of beings that are there nurturing you and loving you and making sure that you're okay, right? Um, so if you realize all sentient beings are your mothers or your kins or your caretakers were there for you when you were vulnerable and you realize it clearly, you'll look at an ant and say, I was your child. You were so kind to me. I was your child. So now what we're doing with these steps of this, you know, these three steps of generating affection, recognizing sentient beings as our mother, remembering their kindness and wishing to repay their kindness is through each of the steps, building up more affection. So we're attracted enough to every being to want them to be happy. It's why it's called love through the force of attraction. Because we are now attracted to them because we found them as objects of our affection through these three steps that started. Everyone blows these three steps. All sentient beings are mother, remember their kindness, which repay their kindness. Yeah, they were good. They were nice to me. Now I want them to be happy. If you haven't developed the affection for friends, enemies, and neutrals, there's no way to get to a measurable love or a measurable compassion. So these steps are so, so crucial. We remember their kindness. We remember all the kind things that every sentient being has done to us since beginning this time. And then the next step 
is wishing to repay their kindness. This is the last step of the generation of affection towards sentient beings. So wishing to repay their kindness. And uh, we don't have much time, so I'm going to get into that next time, more of it. Um, and then the following class, we'll get into more of it. And we're not going to leave stones unturned. Um, we're going to look at these things in great detail uh, so that when we are done with bodhicitta, uh, everyone who attends and listens to all of the classes and, and pays attention clearly will have a complete understanding of it. We'll know how to get it. We'll know why you need to get it. We'll know what its effects are. We'll know what caused it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There will be nothing that you will not know about it. You will not have necessarily realized it. Maybe some of you already have, um, but you will be able to 100% beyond the shadow of a doubt with this information. And that's a guarantee that I make. Uh, so I'm going to read this one more time because I'm so impressed with Dig Naga tonight <laughs> and as always, but I'm just so impressed with this. The one who is transformed into a reliable guide. He's become a reliable guide. Buddha Shakyamuni is reliable because he is free. He doesn't have fear. We want to be guided out of fear. Buddha doesn't have fear, knows how to get out of fear. We want to know how to have infinite happiness. The Buddha can get us there because the Buddha has infinite happiness. The Buddha's in the city of fearlessness and the city of infinite happiness. And if we want to know how to get there, he's reliable because he knows how to get there exactly. How did he transform into the reliable guide? Well, motivated by love and compassion to start. Has to start there because you can't become a reliable guide if you are biased. So you first have to have this intense love and compassion that the Buddha had for sentient beings and wanted to become a reliable guide and sought out teachers to become the teacher and then went to bliss because he matured his mind the way that we will mature our mind and go to bliss. And he became a protector because he knew what we needed to do in order to get out of our suffering that we fear. And he could protect us how to get away from not having infinite happiness. He could protect us from not having infinite happiness because the Buddha is a reliable guy that can bring us to that place and can protect us from pitfalls because he or she knows where they are, knows where all the potholes are, knows the roads to take, knows the roads to not go down because you won't have any tires left if you stop at a stoplight. You know? Would you like to keep going where you're going? Or would you like to have your car burning on the side of the road, <laughs> right? You got to know which roads to go down in a lot of cases, you know, to not have the latter happen. Um, and you have to know, you know, who's bringing you there and that they're reliable and that they aren't bringing you there to take your car or bringing you there to cheat you or bringing you there because they have some motivation and they want their cousin to sell you something that's one rupee for 6,000 rupees. That's not a reliable guide. So the Buddha became a protector and a reliable guide. Why does the Buddha protect us? Because of love and compassion for us. That's why the Buddha protects us because he's motivated by compassion, not motivated by selfishness, not motivated by profit, not motivated by power, only motivated by compassion. So to that being, I make prostrations. That's what Dignaga said. So uh, thank you, everyone. Does anyone have any questions? Um, I know we didn't get much into the, the body of the text of the uh, you know basis, causes, uh, and so forth, but um, we will. We'll get into that next time. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah. So what did you just thank say? You. What did you just say about Dignaga and the qualities of a teacher he was listing? Like just what you just said about Dignaga. Well, Dignaga was, uh, uh, Dignaga um, has these two lines that we've, we read a couple times this evening. Um, and it was in praise of Buddha Shakyamuni. Um, Dignaga, uh, as I said, was an Indian pandit. Um, and Dharmakirti wrote a commentary on Dignaga's Pramana uh, Samukhaya. Uh, and it's called the Pramana Vartika Karika. Uh, Dharmakirti's text is, uh, Dignaga's text is the uh, Compendium of Valid Cognition. 
Dharmakirti's text is the commentary on the Compendium of Valid Cognition. Uh, and Dignaga's two lines is a homage to Buddha Shakyamuni, uh, showing how he is the teacher with a capital T, how he's a reliable guide, how he's gone to bliss, and how he's our protector. Uh, and, and then Dignaga makes prostrations to him. So what about that? Um, I thought it was like right after that. It was like literally the last thing you said about like, um, I think it was Dignaga praising a teacher or like saying that like if a teacher has all these qualities, like I pray to that or I bow to that. Which... Maybe I was just saying that. I might have just been saying it. Like, okay. you know, if a teacher has these kind of qualities, this is the teacher we should bow to. Yeah. Uh, this is, but you can run it back. That's yeah. the beauty of this being recorded. Oh, totally, dude. You know, you can always run it back and, and see. Because I don't remember if I said something. I, I believe I was just uh, paying homage myself to Buddha Shakyamuni and looking at uh, what a wonderful guide and protector uh, he he is. Um, okay. Yeah, Dignagas is only two lines. And in the two lines, you could give hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of class. Crazy. Anyone else? Okay, so we now have a new tradition of reading uh, the eight verses for training the mind uh, by Ulangri Tamba. Um, such a wonderful text. So uh, I think we'll continue this. And uh, eventually we'll have a Buddha's Center prayer book. Um, but we've got to put it together. I have a lot of new prayers that I, I want to do, uh, that I want to add in, including the um, aspirational Bodhis uh sapa vow uh, we could take every class i don't see why we wouldn't um so we'll we'll add that in sooner soon eight verses on training the mind by geshe Longritamba, uh, with the determination to accomplish the highest welfare of all sentient beings who surpass even a wish granting jewel i will learn to hold them supremely dear whenever i associate with others i will learn to think of myself as the lowest amongst all and respectively hold others to be supreme from the very depths of my heart in all actions, I will learn to search into my mind, and as soon as a disturbing emotion arises, endangering myself and others, I will firmly face and avert it. I will learn to cherish ill-natured beings and those oppressed by strong misdeeds and sufferings, as if I had found a precious treasure difficult to find. When others out of jealousy treat me badly with abuse, slander, and so on, I will learn to take all loss and offer victory to them. When the one whom I benefited with great hope unreasonably hurts me very badly, I will learn to view that person as an excellent spiritual guide. In short, I will learn to offer to everyone without exception all help and happiness directly and indirectly and respectively take upon myself all the harm and suffering of my mothers. I will learn to keep all these practices undefiled by the stains of the eight worldly concerns and by understanding all phenomena as like an illusion be released from the bondage of attachment. The fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha land and offer it. May all uh, sentient beings enjoy this pure land. I dedicate whatever virtues I have collected for the benefit of the teachings of all sentient beings, and in particular for the essential teachings of Venerable Lozandrava to shine forever. I send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious guru. I dedicate all this virtue to emulate the knowledge of the hero Manjushri and likewise Samantabhadra as well. With whatever dedication is praised as supreme by all the conquerors who traverse the three times, I also dedicate all my roots of virtue for the sake of auspicious deeds. In that pure land surrounded by snowy mountains, you are the source of all benefit and happiness, all powerful Avogateshvara, Tenzin Jatso, may you stay until samsara's end. I pray that in all of our lives, we, may we always connect with Kensar Geshe Wandak in whatever form he chooses to emanate to us from the Dharmakaya. May we meet with emanation bodies and eventually be able to meet with the enjoyment body when we ourselves are superior bodhisattvas, when we become those types of superior beings because of the merit that we create and because of the understanding that we have may we always, always, always meet with Kensar Geshe Wandak in whatever form he presents. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and by us attending these teachings and uh, accumulating merit and reflecting on these teachings, 
we're creating the causes uh, for the merit to, to have, we're creating the causes and the merit to be able to meet uh, with Rinpoche. So it's very important for us to understand that um, the Buddhas uh, and the Bodhisattvas connect with us when we create those conditions uh, and we have enough merit for them to do so. So uh, by engaging in this, uh, we're creating the causes and conditions to meet with uh, great, great masters uh, and, and uh, including uh, Kensir Geshe Wanda. Um, so thank you so much, and uh, I appreciate you all. It's time, says the dogs. <laughs> Have a good night. <laughs> <laughs>